Good, um, good day, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to this public health conversation. These events are meant as chances for us to come together as a community for the conversations that help build a healthier world. We are joined by expert speakers who guide us towards a better understanding of what matters most for health. Together, we engage, debate, and sharpen our thinking in pursuit of the ideas that support healthier populations. We are glad you could join us today. Thank you to the many who worked to make this event happen. In particular, thank you to the Dean's Office and Marketing Communications teams, without whose work none of these events would happen. Now, on to today's conversation. The US incarcerates more people than any other country in the world, with 2 million prisoners currently behind bars. The problem of mass incarceration is worsened by the disproportionate toll it takes on communities of color. Black men are six times likelier than white men to be incarcerated. Latino men are 2.5 times likelier to be incarcerated. These data, to my mind, reflect a broken status quo around how we address crime, punishment, and rehabilitation. Today, we're going to discuss how public health can help end mass incarceration by addressing the injustice at the heart of the system. We are joined for this discussion by a panel of speakers who will lead our engagement with this issue. I'm very much looking forward to learning from them. I'm now going to turn the event over to today's moderator, Deborah Douglas. Deborah Douglas is co-editor-in-chief of The Emancipator. She previously served as the Eugene S. Pulliam Distinguished Visiting Professor at DePaul University, senior leader with the ORID Project, amplifying underrepresented expert voices, and founding managing editor of MLK 50, Justice Through Journalism. Among her many recognitions, she received Chicago's prestigious Studs Terkel Award. Deborah, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thank you for having me, and it is my pleasure to be moderating today's public health conversation. Um, before I get started with introducing our illustrious guest today, I would just like to um, say a little bit about The Emancipator. We're pretty brand new. We launched in April, and uh, we exist to reimagine the nation's first abolitionist newspapers. Uh, we are reframing the public conversation around uh, commentary, deeply evidence-based, scholarly-driven commentary uh, that seek solutions to the, the nation's most pressing uh, social problems tied to racial equity. I'm really excited that yesterday we went live, we got the scoop with a Brookings NAACP um, new data tool called the Black Progress Index. It looks at where Black people are doing well uh, following 13 rigorously developed indicators. And um, the idea is that if we can find out where people are doing well, we can understand why and we can replicate that in other places. Places. So I strongly encourage you to go to theemancipator.org and follow us in the social media streets at the underscore emancipator. Now let me introduce our speakers for this program. First of all, uh, we will hear from Dr. Angela Adala. Dr. Adala is a research scientist at Columbia University's uh, Melman School of Public Health in the Department of Social Medical Sciences. Her major interest is research, teaching, and service delivery strategies that work effectively with harder to reach or hidden populations in urban settings that are crucial to understanding health disparities. This includes disadvantaged and socially marginalized youth and adults challenged by unstable housing or homeless experience, mental illness, substance abuse, and or criminal justice involvement. Then we will turn to Mr. Emil DeWeaver. Mr. DeWeaver is an African-American activist whose life sentence in prison was commuted by California's Governor Brown after 21 years for his community work in prison. While in prison, he was a culture writer for Easy Street Magazine. He co-founded Prison Renaissance, and despite the criminalization of organizing in California prisons, he covertly organized in prison to pass legislation that changed the way California treats juveniles in this criminal legal system. Currently, Emil holds workshops on abolitionist strategies to develop policy and programs, and he's working on his memoir for the new press titled Ghost in the Prison Industrial Machine. Third, we will hear from Ms. Insha Rahman, Rahman <laughs> who is Vice President for Advocacy and Partnerships at the Vera Institute of Justice and Vice President of Vera Action, Vera's 501c4 sister organization. She leads the development of Vera and Vera Action's advocacy priorities and campaigns across the organization, partnering with government, 
advocates, and organizers to win policy change to end mass incarceration and build safe, thriving communities for all. Fourth, we will hear from Dr. Dana Rice, who is an assistant professor and public health practitioner and researcher who examines best practices in public health leadership and community engagement with a health equity, social justice, and human rights lens. Her primary focus is on the integration of public health and correctional health systems and the impact of mass criminalization and mass incarcerations on public health. And finally, we will close the presentations with Mr. Zal Shroff. Mr. Shroff Zal is a senior staff attorney on the racial justice team. Prior to this position, he was a clinical lecturer in law at Yale Law School, where he worked with students to improve ballot access for incarcerated individuals and supervised litigation against the Federal Bureau of Prisons for its response to the pandemic. Once all of our speakers finish their presentations, we will begin a panel discussion. And we would like to ask our audience to please submit your questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom. Take a look down there, the Q&A feature on Zoom. And I will ask our panelists to wait until our discussion to answer those questions. Dr. Adela, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I'm, I'm not first because I'm best because my name begins with A, either Angela or Adela. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a brief presentation. What I'm gonna start with is really my experience, collaborative experience um, that, that has worked with uh, advocates, um, uh, housing providers um, in New York City um, that has really kind of come to uh, uh, focusing on housing as a point of intervention, a point of intervention to address um, improving the lives of individuals affected by criminal legal system, as well as a point of intervention or how I came involved or invited to be part of this as um, a, a way in which public health can help, can be part of uh, providing skills, resources, tools um, to inform that advocacy and, and uh, program and policy work. So let me just give, this is a story, a little bit, a quick story on one of those experiences called the FUSE Project Frequent Services, uh, you Frequent User Services <laughs> Engagement um, that brought together me, let me find my um, share screen, right? Okay. Um, anyway, so housing, health, and healing. Um, again, advancing housing for decarceration in the public south. This image here is one that we use. It's a revolving door because uh, we also know that, um, you know, unfortunately, many folks who have any entanglement with the criminal legal system end up being caught within that system, back and forth, in and out of housing, but also, I mean, incarceration, um, but in and out of um, other, um, you know, housing, uh, in, in my case, looking at particularly um, homeless and housing system. Um, I won't go over these, but this is kind of what we all know. I think that the politics of mass incarceration really intensifies the interactive effects of multiple axes of vulnerability, exclusion, that are, are the same ones that we look at when we're looking at social determinants of health. Um, lower income persons of color, disadvantaged neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. And as uh, Professor Galea men mentioned, Dean Galea, uh, we also are becoming increasingly aware of higher rates of mental illness and addiction challenges among persons who are caught up in the criminal legal system. But, um, you know, less attention paid to chronic illness um, as, as well as various kinds of other comorbidities. Um, I also think that we can, we in public health can be, um, can contribute to this misguided focus on, on, on recidivism as a focus, the single axis of focus for reentry and diversion initiatives, if you will. Um, and again, these multiple mechanisms, this exclusion manifest, manifest in not just effects on the persons incarcerated, but on their families, on community members as well too, on multiple dimensions, including those that affect health. Just really, really quickly now, some stats from uh, Prison Policy Institute. As I said, we're aware of substance challenges, substance use challenges, mental illness, less so about, uh, and some about um, infectious disease in terms of hepatitis, HIV, et cetera, but also TB, also high blood pressure, diabetes, heart-related problems, et cetera. You can see that, that substantially higher 
among persons incarcerated than persons who are in, uh, in the general population. The most recent 2030 Healthy People 2030 has identified, has set aside a specific category of incarceration as a social determinant of health. I also want to kind of point out that incarceration increases risk for homelessness um, and housing instability in, or, or homelessness increases risk for incarceration. And I won't go through all the dynamics of this, but just in terms of, well, we have a slide here. Yes, persons who are lower income, who are, um, who are housing, it's very, very difficult to not run into um, something being, you know, a, a vagrancy um, um, in New York City, theft of service, jumping the turnstile, um, you know, or sneaking onto the bus or other kind of minor crimes that really, um, uh, really focus, really increase jail population. And of course, the substance related war on drug um, criminals, if you will. This becomes even more challenging in areas that are changing and gentrifying because of the easy, uh, quote unquote, um, quality of life or, or uh, kinds of uh, offenses. Um, we did an initiative, we did a program um, that I'll tell you, this is, this is one of the tenants. Um, what had happened was that in New York, the advocates had noticed that, that they, and the housing providers, that they had served multiple people that had multiple ep episodes of jail and cycling in of homelessness um, and other crisis care institutions, detox, hospital inpatient, ambulance rides, et cetera, et cetera. And so this was a, Hughes was an initiative that kind of succeeded in um, removing restrictions from using publicly supported services, a dollars to provide housing, supportive housing um, for individuals. And then we were brought in as uh, the, the, um, um, the evaluators. Again, a footnote that they had done original evaluation with um, just using, um, I think John Jay, School of Criminal Justice, criminologist to look at matching the, the jail um, um, and the homeless costs, but they didn't include a health, a health dimension and that's what we did and where we came. Um, this is just the disparities that we were talking about. One of, the, one of the techniques that we use, and this is what I talked about a little bit, a more sophisticated technique. We looked at point in time and cumulative effect in terms of jail and services, but yes, there are multiple people that have some continuing contact with criminal justice. But if you really look at this kind of more sophisticated trajectory analysis, looking over time, over a two year period, what we're looking at here is that the red bars, this is the, uh, the intervention and closely matched comparison group, the red bars, are those that uh, times, months, uh, that are persons incarcerated. Um, the blue is if they're in a, in a homeless shelter. Um, uh, green is when both are, are, are white is neither. And just, just really quickly, each of them had on every, uh, median seven incarcerations and, and homeless shelter admissions in the prior five years. In this two years, we had 85% had none or one uh, limited episode of incarceration, no shelter over time. Um, again, I don't have time to go into the details, but I just want to have some evidence that it also saved a lot of money. I personally think that um, saving money um, as opposed to having an impact on health, quality of life for individuals, families, and communities, but that's, that's what, of course, gets the public uh, attention of policymakers often. There were substantial savings, cost savings, and it uh, basically more than paid for the intervention itself. What I want to say now is that this, this is uh, now been, been implemented in multiple jurisdictions and currently being used for the local closed Rikers effort. Closing Rikers are local jail. Um, probably most people know about Rikers Island as one of the most challenging um, and pleasant um, jails and, and, and mechanisms of carceral punishment and limitations. Anyway, the, the notion is that looking at, uh, at the health data and the mental health data, kind of coming, uh, advocates coming to an estimate of there are about 3,000 individuals who are homeless um, and that the need an estimate need of over 2,500 individuals that would need or benefit from, from um, supportive housing using the research from what we've done before in terms of likelihood of recidivation. Um, uh, benefits in terms of health and healthcare expenditures. Basically, the argument is that it would save $1.2 billion less uh, incarcerating the same, providing supportive housing, um, or at least addressing housing barriers 
um, compared to continuing to incarcerate these people. So the, the argument is that, you know, again, part of the plan here locally to, um, uh, to decarcerate, to close Rikers, um, and to change the response to especially these kind of low level uh, quality of life um, uh, substance issues, um, substance abuse issues is to work to provide and pay for more housing and we have the money to pay for it. Um, uh, or at least we have uh, arguments that they can be paid for. And that's it and I'm gonna stop now because I don't wanna take more than my eight minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Okay, I will turn the floor over to Emil. Thank you, Doug. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really exciting to be in a room with so many people invested and in shifting to a public health approach to our criminal legal system and, and using those skills to address the injustice at the heart of uh, our system. Um, I am Emil De Weaver. I'm an abolitionist. And so what that means is I believe in like creating the services in the world and the approaches that mean we don't need prisons anymore. Um, and so that's the lens from which I come. And I want to begin with talking about how it is that we have been approaching criminal justice and how it is that, um, abolitionists would like to approach, or at least me as an abolitionist. And you're gonna hear a lot about particular programs uh, in these sessions. And I wanna talk about not the what we're doing, but so much the how we do it, the principles that underline the programs we design and the programs we support. Because what I have found is that in, um, in shifting from this punitive system, the how of how we do it is just as important as the what. So I'll start there. Um, before, like, you know, for the last like 20 years or so, we've been approaching criminal justice like a, uh, what I call like a broken car factory. Uh, so I, I want you to imagine a, a car factory that's putting out cars and the cars have defective brakes. Um, and people are buying the cars and they're driving and, um, and they're crashing on freeways. Um, and the, the car manufacturer is like, oh my God, recall all the cars, recall all the cars, uh, and they call all the cars back in, and they fire a bunch of people, uh, and they hire new people, better minds. Uh, they do nothing about the car, the, the factory that is producing broken brakes. They put out more cars with broken brakes. More accidents happen. Oh my God, recall all the cars, recall all the cars, uh, fire these people, let's get some legislation. This is, I think, let's, 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 let's reduce the speed limit ways. Let's, uh, uh, let's pay settlements to these families. Let's, um, uh, let's do all these things, but fix the broken brakes. And they keep recalling cars with broken brakes and keep coming up with 101 different uh, solutions to mitigate the harm that broken brakes are causing. But no one is getting to the root of the problem. That is your car, your factory is putting out cars with defective brakes. What we are hoping to do in the world of abolition is fix the brakes. And that is like, what are these brakes? Well, these brakes are uh, the root causes of this thing that we call crime and the harm that happens in communities. And uh, some that you're probably familiar with are poverty and unemployment and childhood PTSD. Um, but if we dig beneath the, the, the roots of poverty, the roots of unemployment, the roots of childhood, PTSD, uh, and, and, and we're honest about who that disproportionately impacts in our country and why it disproportionately impacts black and brown people. Um, we see at the root of these root causes is a deeper root cause and that is white supremacy or racism. Um, we're used to talking about it in terms of racism but racism is a tool, it's a means to an end. The end that that tool is trying to achieve is white supremacy. And so if we're going to fix the brakes on those broken cars, um, we are talking about a systemic power structure and we need solutions based on conversations uh, about power and in particular, the redistribution of power from racist institutions that we've all inherited to the people and communities harmed by these institutions. So I, I begin and I'm, and I'm describing this broken car factory to illustrate 
how a failure to center power in root causes has undermined many of the policies and programs that fall into the criminal justice reform bucket. And as we, as we seek to supplant this uh, punitive legal system with a public health approach, uh, I think it's important to name that we need to hold ourselves accountable even in the discipline of public health of first centering the redistribution of power and second prior root causes. And this way we guard ourselves from dumping our genius and our funding into building another broken car factory. Um, I think a really concrete example of us not doing this comes in uh, California's care courts um, that, uh, uh, that sound like a good idea, this idea of like, let's divert. Um, we have this system that is broken. It is the status quo. Uh, and they're hearing the call from people that, hey, we are, we are um, taking the wrong, we need to take a uh, public health approach. That is like a pretty popular public outcry that politicians are finding it more and more difficult to ignore. Um, and so what do vested interests do when the public is um, growing in support of something that's not within their interest? Well, of course they subvert it. Uh, and one way that happens is um, we're not paying attention to the power and the distribution of it. And this happens and is happening in California's care courts where uh, they have a, they, they are developing this idea about diverting low level um, people who have committed crimes that are considered low level into care courts. Uh, but in doing this, they are also creating new, uh, new new departments that are the same, that are part of the same organizations that uh, are part of the problem. They're investing more power in them. They're getting more funding for them. Uh, for, for example, they are requiring people who benefit from the program to use certain advocates. These advocates are, um, uh, are, are employees of the court or employees of another related agency. And when you look at a program like that, you see you have to examine that. Well, wait. If what we're saying is this court, this court, let's call it courtroom A, uh, is part of a larger problem, uh, and it's been doing things the wrong way and for the wrong reasons for a very long time, and so we want a new solution. And then your new solution is an out is basically an outgrowth of that same court. How do we imagine we're going to get a different result? Um, and um, from an advocacy point of view, a real simple um, shift to that kind of thing is like, well, why can't advocates be from advocates for the people who are getting developed? Why can't they be from community-based organizations? Why can't they be from these people's families? Um, so that is uh, a, a, um, a plan that removes some of the power from a court that is broken and places it back into a community that has been that is being harmed by this broken court. Um, and so that's an example of uh, a, a policy change that centers power versus a policy change that does not center the redistribution of power and that will then just produce the same system, a larger system. Um, we see that also with uh, mental health in jails. Jails are getting more funding uh, to supposedly take care of mental health needs. And that might sound like a good idea, but you are increasing the very funding and the power structures of the institutions that we have already identified as the problem. And so uh, my presentation uh, will be short because it's about process. And I look forward to any questions you have about what it looks like to center the redistribution of power and program design and in policy design. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emil. And I look forward to hearing the questions that surface as a result of your uh, power sharing suggestion. Uh, I'll turn the floor over to Incha. Thanks so much, Deborah. And thanks, Angela and Emil, for um, your remarks before. Um, Emil, you did something which was really locate uh, who you are and what is behind your own investment in abolition. And so I wanted to do the same and share a little bit about myself because you all have bios, but that doesn't tell you um, what brings people to this work and their approach to this work. So I'm a Muslim South Asian immigrant. I came to this country when I was 14. And um, like 
some of you can probably relate to my very traditional immigrant family was keep your head down, you work hard and things will be okay. Um, when I was in college and we're talking the late 1990s, uh, so before uh, Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow and before even the term mass incarceration was the, you know, a phrase that we all understood what do we mean by that horror. Um, the very first time I walked into a prison was when I was 18 years old. I did a college and prison program where students from my college went into a maximum security facility in upstate New York. And there are moments in your life where you see something and you can't look away. And that's what that experience was for me. Um, and shortly after 9-11 happened, and that was another experience that for my family and for myself, it gave not only injustice a very clear frame, but also added a political analysis to how we understood our place in this country um, and our place in the political power structure. And it was the first time I understood, it was the first time my family understood that things that have been happening to black and brown communities across this country for generations are now happening to mine. And I say that because I think everybody needs to locate personally, where do you come to this work? It cannot be an academic exercise because people's freedom, their well-being, our abilities to thrive, it's not academic, it's very, very real. Um, so I've been working in this field for a little over 20 years. I was a public defender for many years in the Bronx, and for the last seven years, I've been at the Vera Institute of Justice. And some of you might know Vera. We are a 60-year-old organization. We're one of the largest criminal justice organizations in the country, and we're known for our research and our partnerships on the ground with government and community partners to come up with concrete solutions. We are not known as an abolitionist organization, and I don't consider the work that Vera does abolitionist uh, because we do work in jails and prisons and some of our work, I think, to Emile's point, certainly contributes to adding more money to that correctional budget or working directly with police departments. That said, I think there is a really important role in the larger movement ecosystem of how we all come to this work and the role that I see an organization like Vera is a harm reduction one and i think the standard that we hold ourselves to as we do our work is is this a reformist reform that we will later have to go back and undo or is this getting us further on the path to actually having uh the presence of life affirming institutions uh, because abolition isn't actually the absence it's the presence of the things we need to be safe and to be free and to thrive and so i wanted to talk specifically today about policing and first responses essentially to people in crisis and people who need help. And in this country, the police uh, have been historically the first and only answer to what our communities need when something happens that is a crisis. Um, there are in this country 240 million calls to 911 each year. 240 million and people are calling for something and the vast majority well over two-thirds of those calls are not for anything that involves even uh, something that is labeled as a crime um, oftentimes it is for uh, a mental health crisis it is for a medical crisis sometimes it's as simple as a uh, a noise issue but it's not the kinds of things that we need police to respond to or that police are well suited to respond to. And I think that acknowledgement at a base level, whether you are abolitionist or not, I think is, is the place to start. What is the right response to crisis when it happens in our communities? And right now we spend as a country 115 billion a year on policing and law enforcement. And this moment I think is a really important uh, time in which to be having a conversation about um, alternatives to policing and taking police out of the role of being first responders because we are finally seeing after the murder of George Floyd and the uprisings in 2020 and again that even after that we have seen over a thousand uh, people die each year at the hands of the police. I think there's a true reckoning even among folks who, like my parents, aren't abolitionists or uh, in communities I come from where people are more moderate to conservative. There's a real recognition that what we are doing doesn't work. 
And we've actually seen a remarkable amount of power and organizing and advocacy lead to what I think is a critical shift in how we are using our resources and our dollars. And so just a very concrete example is today, we have seen over $79 million in this country invested in uh, mental health first responders and community violence intervention. And mind you, 79 million compared to 115 billion is a drop in the bucket. It's the start. It cannot be where we uh, rest on our laurels, but I think it is a really important start. And it is one to, for us to look to, to say there's hope and opportunity to really do something different than the status quo. And so I wanna just talk a little bit about the two things I mentioned, community violence intervention and uh, uh, alternative community first responders, because both are, I would say, the way that we move forward to meeting our community's needs without relying on the status quo and law enforcement. And community violence intervention, I'm sure many of you have heard of programs like Advance Peace or Cure Violence or many others that don't have a sort of well-branded title, but are folks in communities who know each other, who are doing the hard work through relationships and credibility and understanding folks and relationships to de-escalate and to respond to violence so that they avoid it before it happens and to intervene when it does to prevent retaliation. And all of that sort of that language of violence as uh, a contagion is really coming from a public health approach to how do we make our community safe from violence. Likewise, community first responders um, programs like the CAHOOTS program in Oregon is one of the best known. It's been around for over 30 years. And just last year alone, CAHOOTS, which sends trained first responders who are medics and counselors um, to emergency situations where 911 is called instead of a police officer, um, we saw that they responded to over 17,700 calls for service, which is a lot in a small town like Eugene, Oregon. And uh, they didn't need any kind of police backup. That's always the fear. Well, what if there's something dangerous? That happened less than 1% of the time. So that really tells us just how much we are overusing the police and that we have a different way forward that can make our community safer, invest in the right things, and actually meet people's needs where they are. So. I share the concrete examples because what I do for a living is think about solutions and how do we move them forward and how do we get the people who aren't bought in who say I really believe strongly in the police and I support the police and I back the blue which mind you is not just conservatives in this country. There's been a lot of research and polling and even folks who consider themselves liberal or progressive. Uh, say, I support the police, at least in a role to address violence. So that's the reality of what we are facing in this country and the challenge to actually moving toward a world in which we are investing in the community driven sort of safety and wellness and ability to thrive. We are up against these forces where the average person in this country believes, well, the only thing I've ever seen on offer is the police, and I don't want none of that because then I don't know what responds to violence or harm or crisis when it happens. We've got some real work to do to convince people that abolition and the presence of life affirming institutions is in fact sexy, doable and possible. And so I think we actually can have these conversations. Just the fact that in the past couple of years, community violence intervention <clears throat> is seen as a credible and legitimate response to gun violence when it happens. It's not just more police and prosecution. Gives us a concrete example of how do we communicate about what drives violence and what intervenes to make us safer in really concrete ways. And so I'll stop here because I wanted to just share both personally how I come to this work. I wanted to offer perspectives on, so what does it mean to put this work into practice and to bring in issues of power, of race, of equity, of how do we actually shift the dynamics of the status quo to what we want and recognizing that that work is sometimes incremental and some of it is harm reduction, because I know not all of us will necessarily go out into the field and work on abolition, but I think all of us will be working towards many of those ideals. And I wanted to offer a take on what it means to work on these issues in a way that comes to that ideal, but isn't necessarily right there in it philosophically.
Thank you so much for that, Indra. And just thank you for your opening uh, with the question of where you locate yourself in this work and bringing it back down to the, the grassroots level. Um, in my journalism, I always ask myself, will the people in the barbershop get this? So thank you for bringing the conversation to the barbershop. Sexy, doable, and possible. That's my new mission. <laughs> okay, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Dana Rice. Good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen um, here and want to thank you for um, inviting me to engage in this conversation. I'm going to follow in Inch's uh, footsteps and here sort of frame my thinking about um, how we come to address this issue. And I, I really appreciate this quote from Bell Hooks, who um, charges us to, to really think about justice outside of these simplistic binaries. I think the work of public health very infrequently has singular solutions to societal and structural problems. And um, so I hope that this conversation can help us explore what sort of the both and thinking and practice ends up looking like, because I think that that is what is going to be necessary in order for us to truly address the challenge of mass incarceration and think through what the solutions uh, to this challenge are. I too want to start by sharing this photo of really my first public health job because I come to my thinking about not only mass incarceration, mass criminalization, uh, but reform and abolition through my both personal and professional um, experience. And so I won't name the location or the place of where this is, but this was um, a jail where I worked in in a large urban city as a health department employee, department of one, um, where I was situated for many years. And I think it has helped really frame my thinking, not only about the field of public health, but about um, how we have failed to address the harms caused by the system. And this has really shaped my uh, professional ex experience and my thinking about this issue, but so has the fact that I'm a black woman, um, a wife, I am a mother to black boys, and my experience um, in life, in my community, as a family member and as a community member has really also sort of helped to shape my thinking um, about where we go. And so I hope to really indulge in what I would consider more of a disciplinary critique about how we have come to this place and what public health has done and or failed to do to really think about this as a challenge that we can um, work to address here. And so, as I mentioned, I started this work doing some really specific uh, public health work in a correctional institution with my thinking really being framed around addressing harms that were very specific and narrow, thinking that I would make a huge impact on my community. And while the work that I was doing was very meaningful and from a public health perspective addressed a very significant issue um, at the time, which, which in general is, is still a significant issue, I came to realize that I started to experience some frustration over the course of my, my time and the, the 17 years of which I was working in a jail was that I felt like I was doing nothing to prevent um, the influx of people into the system, right? I was addressing a need of which I had recognized that our public health systems had failed to address for folks in community and was serving as sort of a stopgap to, um, to, to the services that people really needed. And so it sort of helped me sort of shift my thinking around if I was truly committed to improving the lives of the people in the communities most harmed and most impacted by the system, was this the right and appropriate strategy for me to take? And so I, I went through this program. It was quite a meaningful experience. It helped me get a, a couple of degrees, right? And in the meantime, you know, it helped connect folks to programs and services and, and folks to care in really meaningful ways, but it was doing nothing to disrupt the system. And so it really has brought me to a place where I have to question really what are we doing about sort of understanding mass criminalization, mass incarceration and public health? And what are the tools that we have available to us to understand this question and then to do something about it? 
Um, I think there are some very specific questions that public health needs to ask both ourselves and others, our communities of which we work in. And those just include some of the things listed here on the screen. But importantly, I think for the purposes of this conversation, the focus on really what can and should we do about it with the skills and expertise that we have and that we can bring to bear on this. And so really the question comes to me is sort of, we've had this conversation about the either or, the reform, the reformist reforms as frequently called, or abolition. I appreciate Insha's commentary about abolition is really about the presence of creating systems of health and well-being uh, to sort of replace the systems, the punitive systems that we've currently um, have in place. And so as sort of I dig into this idea about mass criminalization and mass incarceration, you know, I think we have to think about the work of public health being the work of social justice, the work of health equity, and the work of human rights, and ask it, and I use this term very explicitly is, do we have a responsibility to do the work of reform and abolition? Can this work be done um, collectively, or do they have to be thought of completely separately? And I ask this as a proposition because I, I'm very challenged by the either or perspective because recognizing that we have more than 2 million people currently behind bars, if we take an either or approach, we risk continuing to perpetuate the harms of the system for those folks who are still uh, caught up in the system. What this has also made me realize uh, as I was doing this work is to think, and I'm using the term we as sort of the collective we, the public health community is sort of what are we doing to address the harms of mass incarceration? And to be honest, I said this was gonna be a disciplinary critique, I would say not much, right? So there, as we think about if we are going to really be effective at bringing forth our skills and expertise to work in partnership and collaboration with communities who have been harmed, um, then we have to be skilled and trained to be able to do that. And in doing some research for some, um, some work that we're doing here at UNC, you know, we've done a, a reflection on what are schools and programs of public health doing to sort of help understand, help students understand um, the challenges um, that are experienced. And I would say very few schools are doing anything about um, integrating this content into the existing curriculum. There are very few uh, training opportunities for folks to understand the criminal legal system, even things as simple as understanding terms and definitions. Because when we think about the addressing these harms and developing evidence-based solutions, what we think about doing for one institution, a jail in particular, may not be the same actions we need to take for prisons. There are two different environments. They operate very differently. They have different levels of um, engagement and they are they are managed by different entities. And so I think things, things as simple as having, uh, making sure that we are all clear about the terms and definitions that we use. I think the demographic data and associated health data of people who are in the system, not only those folks, but their families and the communities that are impacted by their system is minimal at best. Um, we have not done a, a good job of framing incarceration as a social structural determinant of health and thinking through that our responses, speaking of abolitionist responses, are social structural responses outside of sort of the narrow health behavior uh, perspective. And really that we can situate our thinking of understanding the problem um, in social theory right, and exploring those solutions. So there's opportunities for us to dig into theoretical foundations that help us think through what um, solutions look like. Um, I think our focus should also be on really digging in deep to really what, what it means to address social determinants, because that can serve as the primary prevention solution for keeping people out of the system in the first place, um, no matter what the system looks like. I think we have to address the here and now of the problem while also thinking of sort of what the future is that we want to create and build in all levels from sort of those reformist reforms that we can think through as sustainable solutions that get us to abolition. 
I think what I have done in my work, so taking it from sort of being in community as a pracademic to coming into an academic setting, recognizing that we have this deficit in training, is that I've tried to create courses at Gillings that help to introduce not only the thinking around mass criminalization, but mass incarceration, and thinking through all of those challenges along the way to how we get to solution, how we get to the goal of abolition. It cannot happen in a vacuum. Vacuum. We don't have the luxury of waiting for, um, for the political, social political environments to change. We have to work at all levels, at all stages of this problem to address the harm. And so I would say really our call from a public health perspective for me is really to dig into the social determinants of health as the primary prevention tool from keeping people entering into the challenging system. The other thing that I would say is when we fail to train students and the future public health workforce on understanding the system, we therefore have failed the practitioners. And so as a practitioner, I was a department of one. I spent uh, 17 years working in this, this, in this department feeling like I was working at the fringe of public health. I would say to this day, there are more people doing this work and engaging in this work, but it has not been integrated into the work like it needs to be if we are going to actively play a really sustainable part in, in reimagining a new system of health and wellness and care and accountability. Um, and so I think there's some really clear strategies that there have that, that certain organizations like human impact partners have identified for the work of public health practitioners, but we can't get to the work of the pra practitioner if we fail to inform and educate the students on, on the system and how we get to doing that work and coming up with these evidence-based strategies. I would also say that it's important for us to also think through that we have to move beyond these declarations, similar as we have done to address racism, but all systems that are rooted in systemic racism. So we have to have really actionable, financially responsible um, actions to communities that are most impacted. And if we fail to address this issue of mass incarceration, inevitably we will not be able to address the harms um, or health inequities as we have deemed them as critically um, important for the work of public health. So I will stop there and I'm excited to continue to engage uh, in this conversation. Thank you, Dana, that, that was powerful. And thank you for servicing the tension between reform and abolition. Um, Julia Campbell says that Dr. Rice's courses are very good, speaking as a current doc, uh, doctoral student. So we can see why. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to Zal. Great. And really great to be part of this conversation with you all. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm Zal Schroff. I'm a senior attorney at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area, and I co-lead a racial justice litigation team here. Um, and I just, just to locate myself in the conversation at this moment, um, I think you know what I see in my friends and family and the community of people who are paying attention is a profound sense of exhaustion of helplessness and of disillusionment in the face of social injustice. And so the questions I try to answer right now in my work is how do we build power for uh, social justice movements? And how do attorneys uh, facilitate uh, that power building? And how do we win um, and actually build a sense of forward motion? Uh, so as a civil rights litigator, uh, focusing on racial justice issues, much of my work in the past has been focused on the carceral setting, seeking relief for the profound harms that our government is visiting on incarcerated folks with every downstream collateral consequence uh, for the communities that incarcerated people come from. Um, more recently, uh, my litigation has focused on mass incarceration's front door, so draconian probation supervision and control by correctional establishments, uh, pernicious court fines and fees that thrust people into poverty and expose them to criminal enforcement uh, and the criminalization of homelessness. Uh, all of these are major systems of oppression that need to be abolished. Um, and we know they need to be abolished in large part because our researchers and public health experts have shown us all the ways in which these systems harm us and harm our communities. Uh, you all have provided that research to us in spades, uh, and yet that research is frustratingly underutilized. Uh, because if we know better, why aren't we doing better? And so the question uh, I have been asking for a while now, and I put to all of you, is how do we operationalize the public health knowledge that's already out there and that you all create 
And how can we make sure that that public health research is considered and heeded when policymakers are politically incentivized against the facts and uh, to protect these systems of oppression? So I'll give you a couple examples of how we're thinking through this um, on my litigation teams at the moment, uh, because we actually start most of our cases now, not with the law, uh, but with the public health research. Uh, and in many ways, we view our role as attorneys as a conduit to deliver the message of public health. Um, and, you know, I think several of the panelists here have talked about the perils of reformist reforms uh, as opposed to abolitionist reforms. That's an ongoing conversation. Um, in some ways, litigation is in many ways inherently reformist. Uh, we are using small doctrinal hooks in an attempt to perform harm reduction on systems that are fundamentally broken. Uh, I, I have no disagreement with that legitimate critique of the project of litigation, uh, but what litigation can do if used wisely is build political power. Um, and that's most effective uh, when we adopt the approach of integrated advocacy. So we're bringing a lawsuit at the same time as folks are lobbying the government for change, at the same time as we're moving uh, with grassroots coalitions of organizing actions. Uh, and we're all speaking the same message with our different voices and platforms. And when we do that collectively, we can be a force to be reckoned with. So the question is, what are we choosing to uplift when we're doing that integrated advocacy approach? And, and what's the strategy there? So for our team at the Lawyers Committee right now, we're choosing an intentionally public health lens for our litigation and advocacy efforts. Uh, and we're using our platform, uh, our litigation platform, albeit an imperfect one, uh, to elevate public health and community health solutions to various systemic injustices. Uh, to tell the story of why abolition is what will save us, uh, even if that's not the relief we can seek uh, through our litigation. So just yesterday, for example, uh, we filed a major case against San Francisco for the widespread criminalization of homelessness, impacting 4,000 people who are forced to sleep on the city's streets uh, because it has failed to build affordable housing and shelter. And then it's uh, policing and criminalizing those communities in unprecedented numbers. Thousands of citations and arrests in the last two years and intentional property destruction of people's survival belongings. That's not only fundamentally unconstitutional and immoral, but it could not be more directly related uh, to questions of public health. So I'm gonna put in the chat a copy of the complaint we filed yesterday. And you all can take a look at that. Um, but I think you'll note, and I, it's around page 26 and page 68 are the other major treatments of the issue, but we intentionally dive very deeply into public health analyses of what criminalization of homelessness does. Uh, how it is proven to exacerbate physical and mental health problems among unhoused people, uh, but also how those costs burden our healthcare system to the tune of millions of dollars in downstream economic and human costs, such that we're doing incredible damage to our collective public health. Uh, and then by contrast, we show that the precise cost savings uh, that would arise if cities actually instead invested in affordable housing uh, as they should be doing. And so when we use that public health research, Research, when we present it to political actors and we give them the roadmap for how to correct their failures, uh, when we talk about public health knowledge in the language of law, we give it power and authority and we force a conversation. Uh, and so uh, I like to think of ourselves as research synthesizers. And so we're designing our cases around the history of racial injustice and also around the detailed public health research that we can compile to show the way forward. And we've done similar work in our, in our fines and fees justice case, uh, where we talk about the profound harms of regressive fines and fees that are a relic of, of failed mass incarceration policies, and that also directly harm low-income communities and bring us downstream poverty um, and uh, public health crises. And I'll drop this one into the chat as well. Here, um, we really fronted, again, the, the public health and uh, scientific research on the harms of uh, fines and fees. And that resulted in um, a major win basically before we had to file the case, uh, before we had to even litigate the case rather, where California um, relieved over 1 million Californians of $500 million of uh, late court debts. And then finally, I guess I can talk briefly about what is perhaps been the most significant nexus between uh, public health and civil rights litigation in, in recent years here, uh, and that's the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the prison release, release cases that so many of us brought to effectively say to the government, uh, your prisons are your current public health crisis, and by the way, they always have been your public health crisis, 
and you don't need them anymore. Uh, and we're figuring out now how to build on that momentum, even as our governments lose interest in taking those concerns seriously. But there was this moment where we were all uniquely oriented towards public health as a framework for system evolution in the context of uh, legal advocacy. So I guess I'll end by just saying that public health research matters uh, and its applied contexts can and need to amplify uh, the work that you all do. Um, and I hope we can work on the public health research to advocacy funnel and that we can work together to actually uh, figure out a way to operationalize the power of the research that's coming out of the public health space to actually force political actors to make the changes we, we know they need to be making. And I'll leave it there. Excellent. That was energetic and it was urgent and I learned a lot in a short amount of time. Thank you so much, Saul. I will now ask all of our speakers to join us for the discussion part of this event. And if you could please turn on your cameras and your microphones. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, many, many questions to cycle through and um, in order to distribute the responses from you, I'll just skip around and not necessarily go in order. Um, starting with you, Zal, I believe that this is for you, um, by Leslie A. Bivens. How do we build collaborations between what students are being taught and what will work as tools in the real world? And I'm sure all of you can answer that, but I'll start with you, Zal. Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting. I find I spend so much time on Google trying to connect with academics who have written interesting things. And wouldn't it be great if there was a way to actually formalize some of those relationships? I think many of us try to do that in our integrated advocacy organizations. And I feel like Vera is in many ways a model for this, but um, we intentionally try to structure it where we have organizers in the conversation who are speaking directly impacted folks. We have our lobbyists who are speaking in the state house. We have our litigators who are saying what's legally possible to challenge, but then we really are trying to develop long-term relationships with academics who are working on these issues to let them know what the pressure points are and what the research areas are that we need to see to pull the levers that we have at our disposal. And so I think actually formalizing those relationships is really critical. And you know, in many ways, uh, students are the conduit. I think like when you're in academic settings where people are in interdisciplinary approaches, they're talking to their friends in other areas, they're naturally forming those connections that we sometimes don't get to make when we're in our silos. Um, but really those connections are everything. And the academic research is, I think what really winds up convincing people, especially in court, uh, beyond what, what we can say as, uh, as attorneys. Would anybody else like to add to that answer? Uh, yes, Angela? Yeah, I just, one of the things that we, I, I mean, that's, that's correct. And that's what I was in my kind of rush this is what we're doing. The advocates, I'm, I'm facilitator. It's the advocates that could use this work, and so we need to be informed about what kind of what's appropriate and what needs what needs to be done. But one of the tools that we use also, in addition to our own students, is we we work with advocates to kind of have data days. So we kind of train, also train up or do classes, really um, informal, but nonetheless, on on having the actual advocates. Uh, and persons with lived experience kind of understand and how to use this work. I mean, I have, one of my favorite my favorite lectures was on adjusted odds ratios. You know, for folks who are getting ready to testify, you know, at a you know at a at a Rikers closed Rikers kind of hearing at city council. So you know, th those are things that we can do because we have those kinds of experiences. We also work um, at, at Mailman. We do have a program at um, local state jails, and we have a, a program, much like some universities have specific programs for returning veterans, we have programs to kind of actually bring in um, uh, degree programs for persons with incarceration experience. And um, a third one is to just really, those are, you know, as much as possible hiring folks with lived experience and from the attorney side as well, too, to be part of you know, your, your team in a variety of ways. Um, so there can be a set classic CBPR you know, to get co-learning so we can kind of learn from each other and inform what we, what we need to do. My, um, so those are just some of the kind of techniques that we've done in working with the kind of advocates um, and, and kind of research to inform advocacy and, 
and practice-based evidence so that we can get at, we can also provide the evidence that's practice-based and not just following the, you know, some other rules. Deborah, may I just jump in with sort of two points around this intersection of sort of research, academia, and practice. One is, I think academia, we need the really robust studies. We need those. But I often think academics have a, a sense of, well, this needs to be just perfect or just this. And in state houses around the country, which is where I spend my time, it is muckety muck. They just want something that they can hold on to for political reasons to cover their proverbial backsides. And so I think for academia to uh, really sort of challenge itself to be like, how do we produce the knowledge that we need? And it's not necessarily research, it might just be knowledge on the timeline that our communities are asking for because a piece of legislation or a policy change or a budget ask is moving now is perhaps the most valuable thing that academia and researchers can do to service social movements. If I could, I just wanna um, chime in here as well because I'm in full agreement about sort of the, the intersection between the academic space and the practical space and really what is needed and used practically um, in this setting. I would also argue that I think much of the work of public health has sit, been situated around defining the problem, right? Like articulating very nuanced, we're measuring lots of things, right? And while that is a valuable, um, that, that data is valuable for communities to be able to use, Public health is also skilled in doing other things around more of the practitioner space, around supporting policy change, around um, um, not necessarily just CBPR, which is a really research-oriented perspective, but getting in community and doing community-engaged work along with community partners, right? Like, so the work of public health, and I'm coming at this from a sort of a master's of public health mindset as a practitioner-oriented degree. So if we are training folks to be in community and to do this work, they need to bring their expertise besides being able to measure disease outcomes or calculate odds ratios. We need to be able to train folks to work in partnership, to build community, to work towards advocacy and policy change. Otherwise, the work of systems change and systems transformation will be one of which we continue to sit at the periphery of change, right? And I think the work of public health calls me to be more at the as a partner holding hands rather than to just being supplying data to, to the work. Thank you both for surfacing the messiness and the opportunities of the real world. <laughs> um, okay, so we have an attendee who asked the following question. I'm very interested in the reform and abolition question and whether they can coexist. When we are doing reform work, how can we ensure that we are not further creating harm, such as allocating resources to harmful systems or institutions? I mean, I, 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 yeah, I'd love to jump in. I think that um, I think that like Insha touched on it when about uh, there's reform, reform, and then there's abolitionist consistent reform. So, uh, what is the what is the reform that reduces harm? But, but two other things are happening, right? One, it's not adding to systems of power that we're trying to dismantle. Uh, and I think she named that as like, is this the reform that we're gonna have to come back and undo? Uh, and I'd actually say three things, it's that. Two, is it does it, does it validate or challenge the very principles that justify uh, a racist system that's calling it justice? Um, so there are, some, there are some like basic principles It seems like Emil froze a bit. Hopefully he'll be- That governor from dog whistles are actually, can you hear me? You froze a bit, so please keep going. There are narratives in our criminal justice system about personal responsibility and something being wrong with the offender and that there is, that, and that there is an offender who, for whom holds all of the responsibility for the harm done in their community, despite the fact that so much power and effort has been put into creating communities with conditions that we are what we call criminogenic by people who have way more power and ability to solve these problems than the person struggling in poverty or struggling in mental health. Um, and so there's a way in which like, there's a whole like, I mean, I've done a lot of reforms. So like the narratives that we create around that sometimes 
attempt to reach across the aisle to uh, validate someone's like preconceptions of what's going on in order to get agreement on on a on an issue. And when we do that, um, we are creating something we have to uncreate later. Um, so there's those two things. And then the third, so at the very least, don't do those two things. Uh, and then the third thing is, and then how does this distribute power? Like if there's harm, there's a reason that harm is, is, is happening. So it's like, what's your analysis that explains to yourself how and why this harm is happening? Who are the players involved, whether it's institutions, uh, people or communities? And then how does this reform shift power Shift, shift, shift capability from the players who are causing the harm to the players who are being harmed. So if you can get all three of those things, that is a perfect abolitionist reform. If you can get two or three, that's at least not creating work that we have to undo and you're increasing the quality of life of individuals. We, individuals are important. This is a structural problem and a structural game that we are, uh, that we need to prioritize. But individuals are important. People are important. Their suffering is important. Um, uh, and so I, that's how you can make uh, abolition consistent reform. I'm, a, I'm interested in this, this idea of, of shifting power or asking other people to manage their own obsolescence. And so I'd like to know if there is like a, a small sort of concrete example of what this looks like or how it's played out in a physical setting. For me or someone else? You or anyone else? I mean, I'm gonna like, so So I have the dilemma of like, you know, there are, there are programs and modalities I know that people on this call will understand. I could, I could refer you to like restorative justice programs, uh, violence inter interrupting programs, but I think the danger uh, of naming those programs is to, um, one, they're available, you can Google them, right? Uh, but two, um, there's kind of this feeling that we are so far away from abolition that we need to like build these other things so that we can get there. And there's some truth in that, but the reality is abolition is already here. These kind of, uh, 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 I, I'll give you an example. I've been, this year I went to a series of festivals. It was like a music festival. It was Burning Man uh, several weeks ago. Uh, Burning Man is 100,000 people. That is a city, right? And the thing that strikes me about these festival spaces is that I'm looking around with my mind being blown around the way people are interacting and the way people are very intentional about not wanting the state involved in anything they're doing. Um, and these people are not abolitionists, but they are practicing abolition because they have decided that I don't want the state involved which means that they have to come up with the systems themselves of taking care of each other, of addressing harm when it happens, of being accountable, of keeping places safe, because everybody wants to be safe and people are doing it and they've never even heard of abolition. And so these structures and systems exist. And like, you know, like the kind of people who go to Burning Man, they have the tools to do conflict resolution. They have the tools and they have the safety to take a step back. They have the tools to be accountable, but those are tools that we can provide any community. And that is what programs that are trying to build restorative justice in communities and do violent interruption doing, they're trying to build the skill base into the community so that we can have abolition. But I wanna name that abolition is not some 80 year plan out. It's happening now. It's just not happening for people like me. It's just not happening for people who are poor. It happens for people who are who have resources. It happens for people who are in the suburbs. The whole public health conversation in criminal justice has been introduced because white kids in the suburbs are getting addicted to, to, uh, to opioids. And so for now, that, like you see, you watch the news coverage about opioids in suburban uh, neighborhoods and you hear about people who are like, fallen on hard times, they've lost their work, they, 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 they have no other options, they're doing their best. You, you, you look at the news coverage of like the crack epidemic in the 80s and you hear about people who are like, uh, who have no worth and have no value and just don't wanna do it and just can't do it right. 
Same exact problem, but a very different narrative. So this abolitionist world exists already. You, you, your theory and where it is going right now exists because this kind of thinking already exists. It just exists for white people. It doesn't exist for black people. And that's the thing that we need to be clear about. Thank you so much, Emil. That was powerful. Did anybody want to add anything else to that? <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure I yielded the floor on that that we need to. Okay, so uh, June Benny uh, posted the following question. Um, As an advocate who has spent more than 30 years in the field of correctional health and decarceration within and outside the system, June would love to hear about how we're going to wing systems off of 911, courts, jails, and prisons as the only response to and criminalizing um, the mentally ill, um, SUDs, homelessness, and poverty. And uh, June says, um, how are we going to get the public health and mental health and housing systems to step up and engage and take responsibility for serving complex, uh, sometimes difficult people who have multiple needs? Who'd like to take that on? <laughs> I can just do one comment. That was the goal of this whole fuse initiative. And they succeeded in getting the kind of, again, at the time, the, 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 the you know, correct Commissioner of Corrections, Commissioner of Homeless Services, the Department of Health, uh, to come together and at least to, to kind of, that's what we call the demonstration project, to release some restrictions on, you know, being able to provide supports or to um, uh, allow persons who were, um, would be otherwise back in Rikers to kind of be eligible for housing. And that was, it's housing first program. So the idea was that these were, the individuals may still have been under parole in some way, but they were not under, these programs were done by community, often, um, you know, advocates that were housing and homeless advocates, as well as criminal justice advocates, like Fortune Society, et cetera. To, so to kind of remove those folks from those, those systems and, and have some way to kind of convince the, the various public agencies, if you will. Um, um, it, it, you know, it's, it, it was still at least a, a kind of proof of concept, if you will, um, and be, being, um, and then I don't know why we continue to need, quote, unquote, um, I don't know, pilot studies or demonstration studies to things that have kind of, you know, kind of been, been, been shown to be effective in a variety of ways, but that's still happening as well too. So it's not, it doesn't resolve all of that, but at least it kind of says, okay, now, and then and, and one of these initiatives is within the, the um, our uh, Department of Health and not Department of Corrections. So, it, you know, it, it, you know some, some moves a little bit not, not, not done, um, but also also being used in active in time and trying to kind of think about um, a positive way when closing records the jail to kind of um, and that would be interesting. I'd be interested in other panelists' discussion about um, opening a women's program, a jail that's you know for for women who are currently incarcerated. That is least the rosing closing roses. You know, and she probably knows about this. Um, to kind of think about what, how can we organize that from the beginning, you know, from who goes in there, how do they get out, what they get in um, differently from, from Rikers. Um, and that's underway in consideration, and at least there's a tolerance for it uh, kind of having it happen. It's small, but, but at least a little, a little opening. Right, Incha. Um, I think we often approach this question of how can we build um, by going to programs. And it's sort of the problem to me of going straight to tactics as opposed to thinking about what's the frame that will help us actually build the entire thing. And just even in the, the framing of people with challenging needs or things like that, I think we miss the opportunity to actually say, okay, so we have systems that are failing us, systems that we have built with a series of choices and investments that are not working. And so if that's the starting place for every single one of these conversations, like what is it about the systems that we have right now that have failed to actually address people's needs because every single one of us is complex 
and has needs. That is just a basic fact of existence. And so if we start there with looking at systems versus looking at people's needs, then I actually think we build towards what we are looking for, which is life affirming institutions, whether that's in government or communities or outside of existing structures of power. And I think as we think about the different ways we can approach the problem at the same time, because I think like that system reimagining that Inch was talking about is so critical. But what we can do as litigators on the back end is remove the problematic options off the table, right? So much of my litigation is focused on how to get police out of people's lives in as many ways as possible. Remove their authority to even be there in the first place. We're doing that right now with our criminalization of homelessness case, but we're saying uh, police cannot go near an unhoused person just because they're unhoused. That is not a basis to have a law enforcement interaction. By the same token, if you have overwrought con uh, conditions of probation and parole that result in mass uh, supervision and surveillance by police um, where people have decreased rights, uh, that's another instance where we have an unnecessary police response. We need to remove the authority of police to be there. And those are things we are actually uniquely positioned to do as litigators because there are constitutional hooks to do it. So as everyone else is doing the advocacy work around imagining a system that actually works and provides people what they need, we can take these options off the table. Let me just also add that I think that as we're thinking through what system creation, system development, reimagination looks like, I think that the conversation that has lived within the public health space has really been this shift to focus on social determinants of health, right? And yet our solutions tend to be focused on what Insha suggested is sort of programmatic individualized solution programs, right, to address that. And I think that we really have to take a look at ourselves around are we really doing that social determinant work of addressing poverty, of addressing racism, of addressing housing, insecurity, et cetera. Because once we really dig into the work, the collaborative work, the unsiloed work of addressing social determinants, then I think those systems will be much more easy for us to develop, imagine, support, and fund um, in collaboration with, the, with, with our collective communities. Because I do think Emil raised an excellent point around the fact that in many ways, many of the systems that we're talking through or thinking about exist in many different places, in many different situations. I mean, even thinking about policing, policing look can look different and does look different in different environments, right? Policing on college campuses looks very different than what it looks like in um, urban, uh, under-resourced communities. Policing, you know, there's still the idea of policing as sort of the power dynamic, but Police practice their 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 practices and their um, their discretion is used in very different ways in those different spaces based on how they think about the populations that they're serving and the tools that they have to use right and so I think as again I would just dig into the fact that I don't think that we have while we have stayed at the conversation level around what it actually means to dig into to addressing social determinants there's much more work for us to do collectively as a field to really dig into that transdisciplinary multidisciplinary work that will require the support of advocates and attorneys to hold us accountable for doing that work right and for um, social workers and uh, other folks in helping professionals to really uplift and hold our governmental structures accountable for supporting the work that we want to see done and create the kinds of communities we want to develop. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to go to the first question we received today, uh, Bonnie Clark, who's waited patiently to have her question answered. Um, she says that her concern is around federal guidelines and policies that PHAs and other housing developments to receive federal dollars used to deny and discriminate against housing opportunities, specifically in Rhode Island, for those who have previous incarcerations. Individuals are released from being incarcerated without an opportunity to secure stable housing, that all individuals who have been incarcerated experience mental health uh, and or substance abuse as suggested by society. And as we know, many individuals are wrongfully incarcerated. Her question is about um, uh, accessing secure housing and whether or not the federal guidelines have changed and are there solutions to housing for those with an incarceration history? Well, I can talk a little bit about that's part of what we had done. And that did, that did, uh, uh, you know, Val, that did, that, that did involve folks that were involved in the legal 
kind of action is both well here. That was what the demonstration project was, removing those restrictions from allowing persons to be able to return to live with grandma in public housing, right? Um, to be eligible for publicly assisted housing supports to kind of have rental assistance. Um, in some instances, they were special programs. More often, uh, more often they were just changing the, the restrictions and the rules on what kind of um, uh, housing, supportive housing, federally funded housing. The also using fair housing arguments um, in litigation um, to kind of arguing that that, again, this is state um, in New York, but the, they were, um, so I don't know the situation in Rhode Island, but it is uh, HUD right now. I do know that HUD, Housing and Urban Development, has made it discretionary that local housing um, authorities can decide or not whether they're going to to kind of restrict persons with criminal justice histories to kind of be able to access public housing or other uh, publicly funded housing supports. Uh, so that also indicates that it's a point of, of potential point of intervention for advocacy in collaboration with researchers and, and legal, you know, the, the legal thrust to be able to, to change and to remove those restrictions. Can I just jump in here and add that I, I also think that um, when we think about and talk about sort of uh, ways to address and protect folks who are returning um, or to prevent them from entering into the system in the first place, and we're talking about things that um, sort of fundamental human rights, like providing food and housing for folks, these are local issues, right? And when we talk about incarceration, uh, these are local issues, right? And so, it behooves us to engage at the, while federal policy and federal standards are important to sort of serve as guidance, they can only go so far as, as what is available um, within the local community. So at the city level, at the county level, um, I would even argue, you know, sort of those levels are much more important when thinking about what supports are being developed than even at the state level or the federal level, because again, they're providing the guidelines, but the action on the ground, the resources, the community resources are at the local level. And so if that, if there is a, an absence of that type of support at the community level, then I think we really need to, to think through how can we be more um, collaborative in our approach to getting folks the support that they need to keep them from interacting with the system in the first place. And if we, if, you know, if we fail to do that, again, sort of focusing on what can public health do in addressing this issue, I mean, that those are some fundamental actions that we could take with, at the local level with local leaders, county commissioners, mayors, et cetera, to be able to support sort of getting people the help that they need uh, just around sort of the fundamental human rights um, needs. Thank you for that. I'm going to try to get a, at least a couple more questions in, and I'm going to direct this next question to uh, Insha. Oh, my screen just flipped. Where is your question? <laughs> oh, goodness. Just a second. Let me just scroll and find it again. Someone added something in it. Reflowed. Okay, I'll have to come back to that one. Um, but Dathion Sturgis asks, do you all have any suggestions on how to incorporate socially responsible approaches to care for future medical providers who will evaluate and treat current and former and present individuals in order to help close disparity gaps and achieve positive health outcomes while trying to address SDOH? I desire to have my students not only be providers, but change agents. Who would like to take that on? And I'm gonna find Insha's question again. Anybody interested in converting future um, medical providers um, information on being change agents? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention that we've been working a little bit, you know, schools of public health have um, I mean, medical schools now sometimes have what, I don't know, three hour lecture on social determinants, right? But, but um, there are movements in the professional associations and there is some effort to try to bring in and have more connection, at least in some of the programs, the, the school public health programs. But I think that is, and you know, we do, 
of those of us who teach, we do have folks that are interested in, in um, going into medicine who are doing a public health. And we have a structure for a, a one-year quick um, you know, public health. And it really is focused very much on the uh, social determinants of well. So it's not a solution, but there is, and, and they talk about another institution that's pretty, pretty strict and under its own control. Um, but nonetheless, there's some efforts um, being made at least to try to kind of, um, you know, provide a, a greater understanding of the context of people's lives and how to include that and be responsive to it and to, and to be voices in this cross-disciplinary, cross-sector work. Um, I don't know, uh, Diana, what do you, what's going on at anything at, 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 at uh, North Carolina with the med school? Yeah, I mean, we, we also have a dual degree program. So, you know, I would say it, the more we can uh, work across our disciplines, sort of the, the bring the clinicians to understand population health uh, from a public health perspective, not population health from a sort of medical clinical perspective, I think is, is helpful. Um, again, because the work of public health goes beyond just measuring the challenges, but thinking about implementing solutions and at systems level. And it's just a different type of thinking. Um, we, you know, so we do have similar programs that sort of help introduce that. In my dream world, I would love for more of the public health work to be more integrated into clinical work, right? So that clinicians um, within their field don't just sort of focus on the individual health, but think through more population health. Um, outcomes in the work that they do. Dana, while you're here, I'll just pick up with this um, question that someone asked you. Uh, they, they, you mentioned abolition has been incorporated into the curriculum at UNC. Uh, the question is, how can we as students advocate for the incorporation of abolition into our curriculum and work collaboratively, co collaboratively with faculty and staff for this to happen? So I would say that abolition in general has not been integrated into the curriculum at UNC. I happen to teach two classes where sort of we talk through um, abolition as part of understanding the system and understanding the criminal legal system and its implications and impact on public health. What I would say from if I were a student, which I was a student, and um, you know, when I was, a, I happened to be a student at BU, and I asked, could we have more courses or some courses or a class on um, getting a better understanding of not only the system but all of the ways in which we can address them? And I think that students have a very strong voice in places like um, uh, BU, in at places at UNC and Columbia, where I think your your advocacy for what you feel is important is, is necessary, but I also feel like my colleagues in this work have to also recognize that understanding the system that impacts so many people and has such a significant impact on addressing health equity is important and necessary for it to be integrated throughout the entirety of our curriculum. So when we're learning about all of the concepts and theories, there's opportunities for us to bring in data that, or, or to think through when we do, um, when we're talking about doing um, uh, sort of assessing the needs of populations through surveys, if we're not asking the appropriate questions to get at understanding what the population needs are, um, we have an obligation to do that. So I think it has to be sort of bi-directional where there have to be faculty to, who understand that this is important and critical and necessary, but there also has to be, I think, students holding us to, holding our feet to the fire to do that, so. Okay, thank you so much for that. We have so many more juicy questions <laughs> on this list, especially as it relates to harm reduction. And hopefully we can figure out a way to get these answers to you uh, beyond this, this presentation. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for, all, uh, for holding space for this lively, informed discussion today. And I'm going to turn the floor back over to the Dean to wrap us up. Well, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you, Zal, Dana, and Shaimil, and Angela, for a really terrific conversation. You know, when I listen to a conversation like this, I, I oscillate between despair about how many people's lives are um, harmed and how much work there is to do to optimism by um, how much the, the very existence of conversations like this portend movement in the right direction. And perhaps the truth is somewhere in the middle, that there are um, people's lives who are being um, 
harmed every day and there's a lot more work that can be done every day and at the same time there is work that is being done there's a new generation to professor rice's comment that is uh, coming up that sees the world quite differently um, so thank you thank you all for what you do thank you for engaging in this conversation really most importantly thank you for everything you're doing to deal with uh, issues that really we need to deal with as a world to make the world a better place every single day everybody thank you have a wonderful afternoon evening and the rest of the week take good care everybody Thank you.